Hi, I'm Fipo, and today I'm starting a new series on how to build in Stellar with smart contracts. In this first video, we're going to start covering a use case of a regulated asset with Stellar Sotoban. So stay tuned and let's get into it. All right, before we start, this is going to be a multi-episode series. In this first one, we're going to cover the use case, the motivation behind it, why build a regulated asset with smart contracts. As we move forward, we're going to have uh, episodes about the smart contract itself, the code, how to build everything, how to run it, how to have a user interface. And in the end, we'll be iterating over this use case, building new functionalities and making it more complete. To start off, why build a regulated asset? If I think about assets by default in the Stellar network, standard assets, once you create them, they don't have any control mechanisms. You can simply send units to other people, to other accounts. There is no one enforcing additional rules on top of that or controlling the identities or anything like that. The blockchain doesn't care about who you are or what you do. It's just control accounts. It's a, it's a ledger. It controls the entries and the balances. So Stellar, has native functionalities to extend upon that. You have the control mechanism. We, say we have a separate video only on this topic. And asset issuers can control their assets in a variety of ways. They can build upon the spectrum by combining these control mechanisms to have an asset that's a bit more regulated, that they can enforce regulatory measures like freezing an account if necessary, approving accounts upon some rules. Let's say they want to enforce KYC before letting someone use their assets and other things. As we move forward from that, we have a pretty neat standard in the Stellar ecosystem. It's the SAP8, which stands for the regulated assets. For those that are not aware, SAPs are the Stellar ecosystem proposals. These are standards created by the whole ecosystem to coordinate their cooperation and make sure they're acting together in a, a unified way. And this standard defines how an asset issuer can enforce virtually any personalized rule or regulation upon their asset by having a separate server that authorizes or denies these transactions. So how does that happen? If a user wants to send some units to another user, so let's say the user here in red wants to send some units to the user in blue, they would need to first go through the issuing authority to get authorization. So let's say they want to send 100 units. They would build a transaction. They would write in the transaction, hey, I'm sending 100 units to the user in blue. And they would send that to the issuing authority. That's the step number one. The issuing authority would have a server that would receive this transaction. They would verify and make sure that it is compliant with the rules. Hey, transactions under $100 or equal are approved by default, so they can transact no extra information is necessary so let's approve it the issuing authority then signs this transaction and gives it back to the user which is step number two so the transaction is signed by the issuing authority now the network can validate this transaction and execute it so in step three user in red simply makes the payment that was already authorized by the issuing authority this adds extra steps but make sure that the issuing authority is enforcing all the regulatory rules they want to enforce upon their asset. What are the pros and the cons on this kind of use case? The pros are that you can virtually enforce any kind of rule that you would like. So if you want to trail back the transactions, make sure they're not coming from compromised accounts. Or if you want to build certain limits on how users can transact uh, every day, you could set up a rule so that no user could transact more than 100 units overnight because they are more prone to be attacked in the streets or being kidnapped or something like that. So you could build this secure mechanism that go around your asset. The downside is the issuing authority really needs to build a server with all of those rules and maintain that over time. And they need to maintain the server. They need to keep up with the capacities and the performance and all the requests they're receiving. And that's extra effort to maintain everything. Also, since this is something that runs off chain, you're adding extra areas for risk for something to happen. So let's say, for example, uh, these servers could go down. If the servers are down, no one can transact with that asset because the rules cannot be enforced. 
At the meantime, the blockchain is going on, so everyone is using the blockchain, but no one can use that asset because they need the authorization from the issuing authority. So that could be a downside. Or if they're experiencing a lot of load, the user could be waiting a long time before the transaction gets approved and they can move forward. Other downsides could be around transparency. You don't know which rules are being enforced. The code doesn't need to be open source. So you could be operating in the dark by not knowing what the issuing authority is doing. So the main inspiration here was how can we leverage this use case? How can we bring a portion of it on chain with smart contracts to make sure that they run on chain? You don't need to put up extra servers. Uh, you don't need to run anything else besides the, the network node. And you can be sure that the rules are going to be enforced. The users will be able to transact as long as the network's up and running. You would still have the same benefits that this extra server would bring to the classic, to the native functionalities. So let's move on to the next steps. How did we achieve that? For the Sorobun regulated asset, we thought about uh, an architecture of two smart contracts that are combined with the token interface. So what am I talking about here? By default, in Soroban, we have the Soroban token interface, which is analogous to the ERC-20 for the Ethereum ecosystem. It's an interface that defines what an asset has in terms of functionalities. And it goes in line with what native assets have already in the network and had in the past. So all the applications are used to invoke these kind of functionalities. This ensures that we are standardized the, standardizing the way we interact with these tokens and facilitates to asset uh, to application builders and wallet builders to integrate with your assets seamlessly without needing extra efforts. So here we made use of this interface to make sure we had all of these functionalities that everyone knows about, like getting the balance, maintaining units, burning units, clawbacking, burning from a set from specific accounts, transferring, and so on, and so on, and so on. And upon this interface, we built a very standard token that behaves like every token in the network, just as a, as a starting point. This ensures that everyone that built for the standard tokens will be able to connect with this token as well, because it's going to use the same interface. So the token contract itself is pretty standard. It controls the, uh, the user's balances, how much they have in their accounts. The, it controls the rules for transacting among these users. It has an admin that can control the contract and control the parameters of this contract and so on and so on. What we did here was to extend its capabilities with another contract. So what it did is we connected some transactions to invoke a separate contract to perform extra validations to add other rules to the whole workflow before they really enforced the transaction, before they really uh, carried on the changes. So in this case, we have a separate contract called the asset controller. And the asset controller is the contract that knows the rules of the asset. So if the asset has a probation period, if the asset has some quota of how much can be uh, transacted by each user. And the great thing of having two separate contracts is that this contract can start in a way and over time you can improve it by creating new contracts with different rules and then just switching which rule contract is plugged into this contract. Another great step of having a separate contract is that this contract could virtually be used by different assets. So it could be shared among different assets. It's a standard implementation that can be used by any asset that followed the regulated asset pattern. So the idea here is that once the users are transacting through the regulated asset, they have a seamless experience. It's like transacting with any token. They could go through their wallets, just making a transfer. The regulated asset itself would carry this transfer almost identically as, a, as any other token, but it would take an extra step. It would send this transaction to the asset controller to validate, hey, I have this user here, the red user. He's trying to send some units to user in blue. So could you please verify if that's valid? Can they carry this on? Is it something that I can do for this user or is there anything else that should be done and the asset controller is, is responsible for monitoring the states of these users their transactions and saying when they can and when they cannot transact what are the benefits of having this 
The first is we have a standardized integration for the applications, for the wallets. So we're using the token interface. Any wallet that builds for any token, any standard token would be able to integrate with this one as well. There's no need for a separate server. So everything runs on chain, at least this portion of the rules, they run on chain. So there's no risk of the server being unavailable. Uh, as long as the network is going on, these rules are going on. Soroban is enforcing it. And you know that your users are free to transact and you know that the rules are going to be enforced for sure. Also, it brings full transparency. The users know what are the rules that they're subject to because they can simply audit the contract. Everything is public in the blockchain. So you can see what are the rules. You can see how they're enforced. You can see your state. So you have full transparency about how you interact with this token. And in the end, it has many other aspects, like it's easily upgradable. You can create new versions of the contract and substitute this. You can share these mechanics with other assets and so on and so on and so on. So let's move forward. How would uh, our user interact with this contract? And in this context, what is the first step that we're taking here? In the first version, we are going to mainly focus on the transfer operations. So right now we're not building anything fancy. We just want to highlight how you can make cross contract calls, how you can integrate to different contracts and how we can extend upon very known functionalities to bring extra programmability to those. So that's what we want to do in here. So we thought about a couple of rules that we are implementing in this first version. Let's say a user want to make want to make a transfer they would interact with the token interface in the same way in reality it's not going to be the user but the wallet or the application so they would invoke the transfer function and they would say hey i want to transfer this amount of units to that other user at that moment the regulated asset before carrying out the transfer it's going to invoke the other contract and go through a transfer validation the second contract then will verify the state of these users and the contract itself. So the first thing is, once this contract is initialized, it receives some parameters on how it should behave. The parameters that we chose here are these ones on the right. So the first thing is there is a one month probation. This is customizable. We're starting with for one month as something arbitrary, but once you initialize this contract, you can set any period you'd like. You could set one week, one hour, one month, one year, whatever makes sense for your asset. So in this case, we're setting a one month probation period. What does that mean? In this case, we, we want to make it so that once a user interacts with this asset for the first time, it gets into a probation period. All right, you want to interact with my asset? Let me see how you behave with my asset first. So here, during this one month probation, the user is going to be subject to the rules that are in this contract. Once this period uh, ends, the user then will be free to transact with the token as if it was a standard token with no regulatory measures. So we're ensuring that there's just a probation period that we want to enforce to make sure that this user is well intentioned. The second rule is to go around the quota. So we have a quota period. And in this case, let's say uh, 24 hours, it could be one hour a week. The quota period is how much you can transact within a certain period. So in this case, during these 24 hours, how much can I transact as, a, as a, an account? And in this case, we have two separate quotas. We have the outflow quota and the inflow quota. The outflow quota is how much the user can send to other accounts. So in this case, I can send up to a thousand units of the token within the quota period. So in this case, in one day, in 24 hours, I can send up to a thousand units of the asset. As of the inflow quota is how much I can receive in my account. So I can receive up to 700 asset units in this account each 24 hours. And one important piece here is that we track each transaction individually. So if I send a transaction now, and another transaction in an hour, and another transaction an hour later, each one of these transactions will have its own expiration date or it will allocate the quota for 24 hours from the moment it happened. So as time goes by and the 24 hours are uh, achieved from the first transaction, that transaction drops off the quota and release it so I can transact some more. And the other ones are still there for an extra an hour and then the other one for an extra hour. So in here, the user is trying to make a transfer. 
The transfer triggers the asset controller and the asset controller verifies, hey, user in red is trying to send some units to user in blue. So what is the outflow code of the user in red? Can I add this amount so they can transact? And what is the inflow code for the user in blue? Is this user uh, under its threshold? Can, it, can, can the user receive some uh, this portion of the assets? So if everything goes fine, this transaction validates everything, updates its value, so allocates the quota according to the transaction, and then tells the regulated asset, hey, you're free to go, execute the rest. And then the regulated asset is going to execute the transfer as normal. So from the user perspective, they would be able to transact with the asset and in case they reach some of these uh, limits, the user wouldn't be able to transact anymore and the asset controller would enforce these rules. So they would receive a message say, hey, you achieved your quota, you cannot transact any more than that, you have to wait a little bit before you transact some more. And after the probation period is over, hey, now you're free to transact. You're, you're just using the asset as any other free asset. So that's the target for this use case. That's how we are tackling this challenge. And as we move forward, we are going to try and bring different rules and further iterations in these features. So stay tuned for the other episodes. Mm -hmm.